Well, let's talk a little bit about you becoming a Truth and Reconciliation Commissioner. I thought that you and the others had been appointed to these roles, so I was surprised to learn that there was a huge selection committee. It's funny, people say, well, how, how did you get to be a commissioner? I said, well, I applied for the job, you know. This part of the country in the north where the highest per capita number of residential school survivors of anywhere in the country live, I know something about that, that multi-generational impact. I tried really hard to bring my personal experience on a very personal level forward as a valuable asset. And what I mean by that is we had gone through struggles in our personal family and we had turned that around. I firmly believed that if that is possible within a family, surely it's possible within a country. And in the end, what can I say? I was the lucky one who got chosen. It just felt like such an honor, but it also felt so important. And I really wanted to do it well, and I wanted us to get it right, and I wanted us to do something that could never be forgotten or dismissed. Why write this book now? I believe strongly that this was a turning point in Canadian history. I really, really was alone, lonely, scared. I thought sharing what I know, sharing what I have experienced, sharing the first-hand account of what happened in all those rooms as we went about our work, that is a valuable contribution to, to set down and to, and to offer up and eventually to leave behind when I can't tell that story firsthand, almost without exception, when survivors spoke to us. The thing that they focused on as being the most devastating, and I was fully prepared for that to be a story about sexual abuse, it actually wasn't. It was the moment of rupture from home, the moment of separation, um, from from family, from from mother in most cases, from parent, and from the, the the bond, the bond of where I belong. How did you, as one of the three commissioners who had to sit and listen at all those hearings and at all those national events, how did you keep it together? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, one of the things I learned, uh, and I learned it. Uh, in, in a crisis moment where I did start to lose it. You know, I could feel myself kind of going underwater, as it were. I, I, was, I was going to start crying outwardly. Um, and uh, I caught myself and I realized that the trigger for me was that I was projecting to my own children and to my own grandchildren and asking myself the question that Canadians need to ask themselves and have been asking themselves, which is, what if this had happened to my child? What if this had been my kids they took away and I didn't get to raise? The response of the survivor who was speaking to me is that they immediately stopped talking. And I thought, I cannot be the one who prevents that person from sharing fully what they came here to say today. So I've got to get my act together and I just, I kind of flipped a switch and did that and carried on from there and that day taught me an important lesson that I must not let myself slide there. You talk about bringing you know unique perspectives into uh, the commission as one of three commissioners. You are married to a residential school survivor. Mm -hmm. Talk to us a little bit about that. It's a particular thing to live with some of the the aftermath of the schools that comes into homes um, whether it's uh, inability to express emotions or whether it's uh, challenges communicating because you weren't allowed to express yourself or to talk about anything, you were constantly shushed. In my case, it was through my husband, but also through our extended family because there are many residential school survivors in our family. Can you share with us just how you balanced being a, a TRC commissioner and also the wife of a residential school survivor? It's kind of stereotypical, but Gee, honey, I had a hell of a day at the office, you know? You can't come home with that because my day was all about things that could be triggering to my husband. I really relied on the health supports that were available because I couldn't take that home. You were there with him when he shared his story at a TRC hearing and that was very, 
it was very touching to to learn that. Mm -hmm. Do you want to share a little bit about that experience? We live here in Yellowknife and we were holding hearings here in Yellowknife. Good evening. This was the natural place for Stephen to be sure able to that. share his experience as a survivor and I think it would have been a disservice to him if the fact of my being a commissioner had made it impossible for him to ever get to make a statement to the TRC. My co-commissioner, Chief Littlechild, uh, was here with me. And so we talked about it, it will all be in the scheduling. I got up from the table and walked around. Stephen came up and I sat beside him and he gave his statement. And that's how it was. It was a very sacred time. Was there ever a time during the TRC that you just wanted to quit? Did you ever think that you couldn't, you couldn't follow through? What your I never once for? thought of quitting. There were days, for sure, when I thought, what if this doesn't make any difference? Is anyone actually taking this to heart besides ourselves? Or are people just going through the obligations of a court-ordered duty that you must hold a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. But I remember something in a hearing that was so beautiful and it was so transformative. A particular survivor expressing enormous regret. They were raised in these institutions in violence uh, with a lot of aggression and, and some various forms of abuse and how they wished that their children knew that they actually loved them and they'd never been able to tell them that. And then this young woman who's at the back of the room for a parent who's speaking to us who doesn't know that child is there, coming forward and sitting down beside their parent and an opportunity for those two, parent and child, to say, I love you, I love you. And you think, okay, whatever else happens, this moment has transformed that relationship. Since the TRC completed its mandate, what has been the positive results from that? Some people are doing big and significant curriculum changes, just to use that example, and yet just the other day I had a couple of teachers from here in the north come up to me and say, thank you so much for this book. We are expected to teach now about residential schools and about treaties and so on, and yet we ourselves do not know enough about all of that. So there's, you know, there's still a lot of work to be done. The Canadian Medical Association has done some extraordinarily powerful work, um, with both in filmmaking and the work that I know is underway right now towards um, uh, apology and correction for systemic issues within the healthcare system. Um, there are. Um, uh, business associations that are trying to work more in partnerships. What I really want is for, is for Canada to see that this is a still unfolding story and for Canadians to see that this is our collective story and that we are, we are all still playing roles within this story and that we need to keep challenging ourselves to play the most positive roles we can.